modernization. So machine learning is becoming increasingly ubiquitous these days, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure you all use machine learning uh, uh, at least a few times in a day. Like I use machine learning to log into my laptop, to open my iPhone, to converse with Alexa, or for that matter, Siri. Um, my laptop recognizes my fingerprint using machine learning. iPhone recognizes my face using machine learning. And Alexa or Siri use machine learning for understanding my voice. And these subtitles that you're seeing on the screen are also enabled using machine learning. So there is some amount of machine learning that goes into, uh, that went into preparing these slides as well. I'm pretty sure uh, Microsoft used some machine learning uh, to suggest me this kind of uh, background. It, this background was suggested by um, Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, so um, based on the title, I just type in the title and Microsoft PowerPoint showed me some design ideas, one of which is this. So obviously there's some machine learning going on there as well. But before we delve deeper into machine learning, I want to introduce some guests. So any guesses on who this person is? Anyone has seen this person before? Okay, I'll show you another person. How about this? So these, all your guesses are going to be wrong because these people do not even exist. These are fictitious characters generated by a generative adversarial network. So it's a machine learning framework which generates these images. And you can see how uh, real life, real looking they are. So how do we generate these pictures? It's by playing a guessing game, basically. The, the programs play a guessing game like people play. <clears throat> but first for machines to work, everything needs to be in numbers, right? Because machines, you know, um, they work with binary streams of ones and zeros, bits, right? So everything has to be numbers. So yeah, so these uh, pictures, I got them from this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com, very aptly named. Actually, you can click on this and oh this is opening up here so each time each time i click i go to the website it generates a new uh face you can click another and within no time it clicks it generates a new face which is real looking so that is the power of uh, machine learning to start with and um so, uh, so yeah, everything needs to be a number. So a, an image is to the machine, the image is a bunch of numbers, right? So you all recognize this famous personality, right? Abraham Lincoln. So to us, he is Abraham Lincoln, but to the machine, it's a bunch of numbers. So what are the numbers? They are the pixel values, right? So the, to the machine, a face is a matrix of numbers. And uh, what is each row of a matrix called? It's a vector, right? It's a row vector, basically. And uh, what is the study of matrices called? It's linear algebra because uh, matrices typically represent linear equation, linear system of equations. So it's called linear algebra. So vectors, matrices, and linear algebra are fundamental to machine learning and to uh, the emerging uh, technologies as well, like quantum computing, right? So now back to our problem of how to generate these images, these real looking images. So it's like how we play the game called Akinator. When I was a student, we used to play this a lot. And those days it used to be called bullseye. I think it may still be called bullseye in uh, India where I grew up. 
Um, so the game is very simple. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a website for this as well called uh, akinator.com, en.akinator.com. So the akinator is a genie. And then the genie asks you to think about a real or a fictional character. And the genie is going to guess who it is, right? So, um, so I, I think about a character and the genie is going to ask me, is this a male or a female? Or rather, the genies, the answers have to be in yes or no. So the genie is going to ask me, male, is, is the person male? Then I'm going to say, yes, probably. Then the, uh, um, then the akinator is going to ask me, is the um, person a celebrity? Then I might say, yes, as well. Then um, uh, the next question could be, is the person a politician? I would say, no. Uh, then the next question could be, is the person a cinema actor? Then I might say yes. Then uh, what is the, the, the actor might ask questions about the genre of the movies, the actor, actor, and so on and so forth. And eventually the actor is going to guess who the person is in my mind by asking a number of questions. And the answers are yes or in yes or no. So um, a similar thing happens in generative adversarial networks. So another analogy is like how a kid learns to write the alphabet, right? Like I remember the days when I learned the alphabet. Um, uh, it's many years back, but still I remember uh, vaguely. Um, so how my mom uh, uh, taught me how to write the letter A. So she would tell me, I would, I would uh, just in the first instance, I would scribble something like this, some uh, nonsensical, uh, scratch on the paper. Then obviously my mom would say that's not correct. You have to write a, uh, I still remember my mother's words. She said, write uh, one circle followed by a half circle, one full circle followed by a uh, half circle. So that is some feedback that I got. And based on that feedback, I did something uh, which is somewhat closer to A. Um, but still it wouldn't be any, any close to the real looking A. So I would, after many iterations and after getting uh, feedback in every iteration from my mom, I finally would learn to write A. So that, that is exactly what happens here. Um, there are two programs here actually, there's a generator and there, then there's a discriminator. Both of them are machine learning programs. So the generator initially generates noise, just like the little kid generates noise, the generator generates noise, it's complete random noise. And then many attempts later, based on the feedback, the discriminator acts like the parent, generator acts like the little kid and the discriminator acts like the parent. So just like the little kid improves uh, after many iterations and getting feedback from the parent, so generator gets feedback from the discriminator and after many attempts it it is uh, it generates something that is close to a uh, person's face but the discriminator would still say no that is not correct and pass some feedback to the generator and eventually after many 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 attempts the generator the discriminator is going to say okay good you did a good job generator you the image that you have, uh, you have generated it is, a, is a picture of a real person. So you, the generator basically tricked the discriminator to believe that the generated image is uh, that of a real person. So there are two things happening. So one thing is generation, generating data from random noise. Uh, the first attempt is a total random noise and slowly um, a real looking face is generated. So that is one part of it. And the other part is adversarial. So the discriminator is acting like an adversary to the generator. I mean, typically uh, they should not be, but parents or teachers are sometimes seen as adversaries, right? Uh, playful students, playful kids. Um, they think of uh, parents or teachers as uh, adversaries, though parents and teachers are actually helping them learn. They consider them as adversaries because uh, um, 
the the way this keeps saying no to things um, probably is a cause for that. So same thing is happening here. Discriminator is acting like an adversary. So that is the reason why the pair of these programs uh, is called um, generative adversarial network. So a little more detail. So we all know, uh, just like in the real world situation, parent is already trained, right? The first uh, training happens to the parent. So similarly, the discriminator is trained first. Um, so the, just like the parent is trained already on how a letter should look like, the discriminator is trained on how a real uh, image should look like. Um, so um, again, this also happens uh, uh, in a number of iterations. It's not going to learn right away, right? So, um, so what happens is that the discriminator is passed two kinds of images. One is fictitious images at the bottom and the real images at the top, right? So, um, and these images are labeled as uh, real images or fake images. So the data set is already labeled. So based on the, um, um, this data set, the discriminator learns and the way it learns is by what is called as a loss mechanism, right? Loss, we all know, I mean, what is loss? Um, just like uh, when a person buys a car for say $10,000, and then uh, as soon as he buys the car in the new state that he arrived at for his job, his boss says that, oh, you have to travel to a different state. He will have to sell the car. So next week he sells the car at, for $7,000. It's a loss of $3,000, right? So the same concept is here. So the loss is basically the numbers that are expected to be generated by the discriminator, but the, discriminator is not going to generate the exact numbers. So the difference between what the discriminator generates and what it is expected to generate is the simplest loss. But uh, an analogy for loss is also uh, like uh, the feedback from the teacher, right? The feedback from the teacher to a student. If the teacher is uh, too lenient, the student is not going to learn quickly, right? The rate of learning is slow. If the assignments are uh, um, just uh, slam dunk and uh, the, uh, the quizzes are slam dunk, very easy to pass, the student is not likely to learn a lot. It doesn't serve as a good motivation. The same thing with loss functions. Loss functions uh, provide the most important, most needed feedback for the machine learning program to improve. So if the loss function is simple, difference between what is expected and what is generated, then it's not enough for the program to actually learn, right? So the loss function, that is the reason why it's called loss function, not just loss, right? So we typically come up with a function to represent the loss, right? Uh, so it's slightly involved. Um, but the essence of loss is still the same, the difference between what is expected and what is um, really output, but uh, it's a little more involved, like uh, simple loss. Uh, one of the most often used loss functions is the RMSE, right? Squared error, instead of just the difference between expected and uh, um, uh, output, you actually square that difference. So squared error is one of the loss functions which is typically used in machine learning programs. Uh, there are several other loss functions also, like uh, now uh, next month's event, the conference, uh, one of the professors is going to talk about fuzzy loss functions, right? The loss function is not only uh, more complicated than just a difference, but it is also fuzzy. That means it's not deterministic. Um, so there's a lot of uh, research in the loss functions area uh, because loss functions, just like uh, the feedback drives learning in human setting, right? The feedback that the professor gives to the students drives the learning in the human setting. 
same thing with uh, uh, machine learning, right? The feedback that is given to the program by way of loss functions uh, tells how well the machine should learn, right? Um, so you can think of loss as a lesson or, or something that is uh, like a feedback, a lesson to learn. Um, the adage goes, right, no gains without pain. So loss represents the pain uh, that the, the program should take to become better. So the discriminator is trained now. The next turn is for the generator. Uh, again, the generator is trained in iterative fashion. The, this time the um, loss is computed by the discriminator and then that loss is passed to the generator. Um, so the generator goes over a number of iterations and finally learns to generate real looking images based on the loss that is computed in each iteration, right? So this is a schematic for the entire uh, uh, setup. So you have a generator and a discriminator. So these blocks, so um, what are the, uh, how many numbers does an image have? Like for instance, take uh, a typical resolution of uh, 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. It's called 1080p, right? So how many numbers are there in that image? How many pixel values? Two million, right? Two megabytes, typically. Two million uh, values. So you have to pass two million values to this machine learning program, which is substantial, right? So, um, and then it is wasteful also, right? Why is it wasteful? It is wasteful because the pixels are correlated, right? For instance, the pixel, you, this is eight, right? So this pixel here and the one below it is, they're correlated, right? If, it, if this is going to be black, this is go, also going to be black, right? Similarly, if this is going to be white, the adjacent uh, pixels will also be white. So they're all correlated. So what is the point in making the machine process 2 million values, which are all correlated, mostly correlated, right? So to reduce the computation, there's a technique called convolution. In math, there is a convolution operator, but it is, it is not the same as the convolution machine learning. Uh, but they use, I mean, we, um, overuse the terms, right? In computer science, there are so many terms which are overused. Um, just like in object-oriented programming, operator overloading, uh, we overload some terms. So convolution is one such term which is overloaded, but essentially what it means is you are going to combine a bunch of pixels into one value before passing it to the uh, machine learning program. So that's why the uh, these boxes represent the convolutions, right? If you look at the discriminator, um, the image is a big box, then through the convolutional layers, the size is really reduced to a smaller box. So it's called convolutional neural network. The program is called convolutional neural network. We'll come to neural networks a little later, but uh, it's a machine learning program. Neural network is a machine learning program. So CNNs, as they are called, convolutional neural networks are commonly used for image processing. So that is the idea of a generative adversarial network. We are going to have a bunch of images which are already labeled called the training data set. Um, and then uh, we train the discriminator first and then the generator. And then the whole setup is going to uh, generate real looking images. So here's an example of generating handwritten digits. You can see how it is all noise in the beginning, random noise, totally doesn't make sense. And after many, many trials, it's going to improve and then the numbers are going to look like uh, 
numbers, handwritten numbers, right? So that's how these uh, handwritten digits are generated using GANs. So this is um, a um, phase GAN demo. So it uses actually two GANs. One is called uh, progressive growing GAN and the other is transparent latent space GAN, TL GAN. So you can actually configure um, the face, um, you, how much machoism should look in the face and what are the other things, uh, the hair color and all that stuff, they are configurable. So we'll talk a little more about those kind of GANs, but I wanted to impress you with this movie that is entirely generated by artificial intelligence as well. Or rather the screenplay, not the movie, but the screenplay. So, so the screenplay for this movie is entirely generated by artificial intelligence, not just images, but the movie screenplay itself. So to save time, I'll just... In my life, You can see the expressions in the face and all that. Uh, so the screenplay is entirely generated by artificial intelligence. So that is the power of machine learning. So in this context, I wanted to, I'm a great fan of quotations and uh, uh, this quotation is very much applicable to uh, the big data and particularly using generative models. So what I cannot, I believe, uh, yeah, Richard Feynman is a Nobel laureate. And what he said is, uh, what I cannot create, I do not understand. To understand data, we need to create data. Until we create data, we haven't understood data. So that is the goal of generative models and uh, generative adversarial networks is an emerging trend in machine learning. In fact, every week, um, new papers using generative adversarial networks are coming up and there's a website called, uh, uh, on GitHub, there's a, sorry, there's, there's a GitHub uh, repository which is tracking all these um, GANs, different types of GANs that are coming up um, on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And you can see it's exponentially growing. The number of papers in GANs is exponentially growing. And you can see the types of GANs. All these are generative adversarial networks. Hundreds or maybe even thousands. I, I don't remember the last number, but there are thousands of, uh, of GANs. So there's a whole zoo out there that you can explore. So I explored one animal in the zoo uh, with my students. Uh, and that experiment uh, is in music, but uh, we used uh, this paper uh, on cycle GAN. Oh, sorry, I, I'm not showing it. So this paper is uh, on cycle GAN. Um, so the original cycle GAN paper, which I'm showing on the screen, uh, was used to convert between similar looking images. For instance, in this case, horse to zebra. So for that kind of a problem, we typically need several paired examples in the training data set, right? Uh, we need an image of horse, and then we need an image of zebra, which corresponds to the horse. And then we can, uh, we need to tell them program that, okay, this horse corresponds to this zebra. But that's a very expensive operation. I mean, how are you going to find a number of horses and then equivalent zebras, who, which look exactly like the horse? It's a challenge, right? Paired images is a big challenge, collecting data set of, a pair of paired examples. So that is where cycle GANs help. So cycle GANs um, do not require paired images. 
you can collect any images of horses and any other set of images for the zebras, dump them together into the program, and the cycle GAN is going to figure out the similarities. Right? So the loss, it is still based on losses, uh, loss function, but uh, the loss that is computed here is uh, uh, cycle loss. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the concepts in the next slide, but um, uh, so uh, this is still based on uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, and because of the cyclic operation, it's called cycle consistent adversarial network. So, so this is uh, uh, the basic idea of cycle GAN. And um, if you try to think how this is happening, uh, what the cycle GAN program is essentially doing is trying to get hidden latent features of both the horses and the zebras. See, I'll give you a simple example. Suppose you are given a normal distribution with mean some number x1 and the standard deviation x2. Can you generate another number which um, conforms to that distribution? You can, right? You know probability distributions. You know the parameters of a probability distribution. You will be able to generate any number of numbers conforming to that distribution. The same thing is happening in this example, in machine learning, um, one kind of machine learning, we try to find the real hidden parameters, the, uh, the latent features of the data. And then once we know those latent features, we can generate any amount of data uh, which conforms to the, those features. So we use cycle GAN for um, one of my uh, interests, which is Indian classical music. When I, I've been trying to learn Indian classical music since my childhood, but in vain for various reasons, time being one of them. But the interest doesn't die, right? I mean, it's, it's inborn. So, uh, so I use uh, machine learning for uh, music. Uh, my latest paper is also on uh, applying deep learning for music. Um, so uh, we use cycle GAN to convert a melodic framework. In Indian uh, music, it's called raga. Um, there are two styles of melodic frameworks in India. One is the North Indian style, which, is, which has influence from the Mughals and the Middle East. And then there's a South Indian um, uh, style as well. So we use cycle GANs to see if we can convert a melodic framework in the North Indian style to a melodic framework in the South Indian style. So as you can see here, cycle GAN, this whole setup is called a cycle GAN. Cycle because there's a loop and then GAN because it's a generative adversarial network, a pair of GANs actually. So, Cycle GANs have a pair of uh, generator and discriminator. Um, here uh, we see the first pair in pink and the second generator discriminator pair in uh, green. The first pair works to convert music in a North Indian raga. It's, uh, the melodic framework is called Bhairavi to a South Indian melodic framework called Shanmukha Priya. And the second pair does the opposite. Um, so the generated discriminator pair works just like before, uh, just that uh, instead of random noise to start with, the generator starts with a um, with a real note, you know, a musical note. So we input original music notes in uh, the North Indian melodic framework, uh, which is Bhairavi. The as you can see, the original samples are shown in yellow. These are the original music snippets in both uh, North Indian and South Indian uh, uh, styles, right? So, um, 
simple loss or simple adversarial loss, like in the generative adversarial networks is not enough. So we compute cycle consistency loss to determine how different the generated raga is from the original raga. So we start with a, uh, with this North Indian raga, the thick lines. Hello. Yeah. I was wondering, are there people who are, is there human intelligence that indicates that what you're trying to do is different? Are there people who know North Indian style in their brain, South Indian style in their brain? Yes. Ah, thank you. Yes, in fact, in the previous example, this is a good example, right? Uh, we are all human beings and we are able to tell that the horse is really looking like the zebra, right? So that human uh, discern, discernment is always possible. So in fact, for this project, we talked to a bunch of uh, musicians as well, and uh, we, um, uh, it was a small snippet, so it wasn't very, um, the musician could not thoroughly say that, okay, this is confirms to this raga, but it was close. He agreed that uh, it was close. One of the musicians agreed that it was close, but yeah, the human discernment was there. So, um, so yeah, so uh, the, uh, uh, the cycle basically is shown in arrows. The thick arrows denote the transfer from the North Indian Raga to South Indian Raga, and the thin arrows or the regular arrows show the other way around, right? So, uh, so what happens is you pass this North Indian music uh, in Rag Bhairavi to the first generator. It produces, based on the feedback from the discriminator, it produces um, the South Indian Raga, right? And that in turn is passed to the second generator and that converts to the North Indian Raga back. So our goal is for this music snippet to match the original music snippet because it has gone through the cycle. But obviously it will not because it's a program. Uh, it's not perfect. Machine learning programs are not perfect. So there's a loss. There's a difference in what is expected and what is computed. And that loss is called a cycle consistency loss. This is what is used to improve the whole process, right? So the GANs basically bring together two powerful paradigms. Um, which are um, often used. One is the deep generative models and the other is the adversarial learning. So there's a lot of promise here. In fact, GANs have proven to be much better than some of the older models. And this is the way going forward. So this is uh, from a paper that we published with two of my undergrad students uh, who did all the experiments. Um, and uh, we published it in uh, Springer Proceedings. Um, so this is um, music generated by artificial intelligence. So, So Aiva, artificial intelligence virtual artist, is uh, an artificial intelligence composing soundtrack music. So I believe it's from NVIDIA. Uh, so uh, you can try it out actually. There's a website called AIVA, artificial intelligence virtual artist. Actually, maybe I can click. But anyway, uh, you can try it out, AIVA.AI. Uh, and the music is all produced by artificial intelligence. And machine learning is one of the, when I was a student of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning was a very small component of artificial intelligence. But today, 
machine learning and artificial intelligence are more or less synonymous they are used almost interchangeably so that uh, that is how much machine learning has grown in these years so so hopefully you are now convinced that machine learning is the motor of modernization a lot of modernization is happening by way of happening by way of modernization and it is driving innovation in fact it is driving the progress of civilization itself and uh, machine learning will continue to be a key economic driver right uh, it's uh, google is entirely powered i mean mostly powered by uh, machine learning right uh, and you know the market cap of google uh, for that matter most of these top companies the economy is uh, which are driving the economy they they are uh, they are being uh, powered by machine learning essentially so you would, i don't know how many of you have noticed machine uh, google searches have improved tremendously in the last 4 5 years it's because of machine learning a, frame, a framework machine learning framework called bert uh, that google invented it's a natural language processing uh, framework so it is really an exciting time to be working in this area so some of the key concepts right first thing to note is machine learning is a paradigm shift right there are a um, lot of new things happening in machine learning so in the pr traditional programming we looked at uh, limited data for instance we looked at personal characteristics of one person so analyze one person and then we model the behavior of that one person i'm just giving an example but uh, uh, an easy example to understand but uh, traditional programming goes a lot more beyond this simple example but the essential idea was to analyze limited data and uh, come up with a behavior for that data so in this case if the person x is polite magnanimous and all that stuff good stuff then the person we classify as good otherwise uh, bad or not good or whatever so that is the traditional programming way so we generate this model from one person and apply it to everyone so whenever a new person comes we are going to uh, check uh, uh, let the person pass through this uh, code in the left and then see if the person is good or bad right that is typically what we did in traditional programming so we model a behavior using if else constructs and loops and apply it to all but in machine learning it's the other way around we analyze many and then apply to one so we analyze a whole lot of population of uh, uh, data could be people could be customers could be anything we analyze many people and then from the observations that we make by analyzing many we apply to one so there's a new person coming in this person is 90% of the time polite 83% of the time magnanimous is this person good or bad is the question that the machine learning program answers so it, we are actually flipping the problem around from personalization uh, to generalization to generalization to personalization so the left side is called the training data the whole big bunch of population that we are going to analyze is called the training data and the uh, limited data that we are going to apply this uh, behavior to is called the test data so in traditional machine learning training data is essentially a table of numbers everything has to be numbers in for machines to work on right so it's a table of numbers so the rows are instances so the instances could be those of people customers emails streets houses any other items so each row represents uh, that instance um so for instance you want to predict the uh, income of a person or the price of a house for instance let us take the example of price of a person of a house right so each row is a house in that area and this y is the price of the house so 
So those are the rows. And what are the columns? The columns are the features of those instances. So the first feature of the house could be um, the number of bedrooms. The second feature could be, um, what do you call that, flooring, whether it's carpeted or whatever. So, and then the roofing, um, shingles or whatever. So all those are features, right? So the columns represent the features and the rows represent the instances. The last column is a classification category, like good or bad, if it is, uh, we are uh, considering whether the person is good or bad, why will be either good or bad. But in this case of a house, it will be the price of a house. It's a real number, right? It could be either uh, uh, classes or a real number. Both are possible in machine learning. So here, what we are doing is we are collecting data and we are also given the, the resulting values for the data. So we have a bunch of houses and then we already are given the prices of those houses. We need this Y column also in one kind of learning. So we are given data and the results for that data. From that set, we are going to generate a program or a model, right? But one thing is uh, important. The features should correlate, I mean, should uh, uh, somehow determine Y. There should be a relation between Y and the Xs. So if, we, if X is not related to Y, it's not going to contribute to predicting the uh, value of Y, right? Suppose we, um, there's a completely um, irrelevant feature, like say the social security number of a person. It, do, it does not tell you in any way whether the person is good or bad, right? If one of the features or the columns, columns or features, they are the mean the same. If one of the columns is social security number, it's not going to help, right? So we want all the X's, the features, to be uh, somehow able to determine the value of Y. So that is an important thing. So based on this kind of data set, we are going to generate a model, which is like our program in the traditional programming. And then we are going to apply that model or program on one data item or two data items, uh, which is called a test data. In this test data, Y is not observed. Y, we don't know the value of Y. We are predicting the value of Y. So in this case, uh, the X1 is 90%, 90, X2 is 83, so on and so forth. What is the value of Y is what we are going to predict. So here, data and the results are used to generate the program to predict the behavior of a new item. And the last column is uh, the result, right? So, uh, so another uh, important concept in machine learning is, we all know that uh, this is a vector, right? Each row can be thought of as a row vector. Right, you can think of uh, the numbers from X1 to Xn in each row as a feature vector. It is a vector because it's a series of numbers and it is a feature vector because those numbers represent the features, right? So each, uh, this part of the row, the first X is part of the row is a feature vector, right? So that is the other way to look at it. Now, a very important thing to note here is that vector has two interpretations. In mathematics, vectors have two interpretations. So one interpretation is, of course, a series of numbers. Does anyone know what is the other interpretation? A vector. So the other interpretation is a point in space with both magnitude and direction, right? A vector. So if you look at um, the search for vector here, it is if you search for vector. Oh, um, uh, 
vector math maybe this will so if you look at uh, the results when we search for vector math you will see images like this right so it's geometrical it's not numbers but it's actually geometric so vectors have two interpretation one is uh, as a series of numbers single row or column of numbers the other is as a point in space with both direction and magnitude right so this is a very important concept that we are going to use so in fact machine learning relies heavily on um, this happy marriage of algebra with geometry so most of the machine learning algorithms are based on that concept of uh, the combining or the coming together of uh, um, algebra and geometry um so each instance it could be a person house email whatever you are trying to study it is actually a point in space with both magnitude and direction so if it is about a class of students then each student is a point in space with magnitude and direction right so that is an important thing in machine learning now another thing to note is the role of features so there are a bunch of features right uh, for instance for the for the predicting the price of a house the features could be um, the number of bedrooms the carpet uh, the type of carpets the type of uh, roof so on and so forth so a general question a, a common question is will all these features play equally important role in determining the price of a house probably no right i mean you, uh, why are you going to care uh, uh, so the number of bedrooms probably plays a major role right compared to say the car type of carpet right i mean i can change my carpet i don't care for the carpet right i can always get in and but number of bedrooms probably will have a higher weight so each of these features typically do not have the same weight same level of importance in any machine learning problem typically the features do not have the same weight so you take the example of students also right you want to predict the success rate of students so the features that you study from the student data are not equally important sometimes hard work plays uh, for some subjects hard work plays a better role than iq for some other subjects like machine learning analytical skills play a better role bigger role than uh, say hard work so things like that so in most of the settings the features are not equally important they are unequally important yes, yes. are they coefficients between the beginning or is that part of how Uh, yeah that's a very good question and it's a leading question as well um the question is uh, uh is there can we assume linearity with the data all the time right so that is not always true in fact for most of the data linearity doesn't apply so a lot of machine learning at least advanced machine learning is based on non linearity so in fact the distances if it is linear data then distances between two points two instances can be computed uh, using euclidean formula right euclidean distance the typical euclidean distance but if the points are not in a non linear space non linearly correlated uh, non linearly uh, in a non linear space you have to use different metrics so there is something called geodesic it's an active area of research Uh, but yeah uh, typically um, for advanced uh, machine learning algorithms at least uh, linearity does not apply but I, there are a lot of problems which are linear as well or at least we assume that they are linear and use some simplistic machine learning models um, and still are able to get very good results yeah 
So yeah, that is the surprising finding in machine learning. We assume some drastic things, but we still get reasonably good success rate. Yeah. <laughs> so um, another uh, very simplistic assumption is uh, that these features are all independent of each other, mm -hmm. which is not true, right? Uh, uh, but still we assume that and still uh, we get sufficient success rate using some machine learning algorithms. So this model, Yes. So um, that is the essence of machine learning, basically finding the coefficients or the weights, right? Each uh, feature has to be weighed, right? Finding the weights for these features is what this model is. In fact, the model simply comprises of the weights for each of these features for most of the models, machine learning algorithms. So, um, so yeah, model is essentially the weights given to the features. Once you determine the weights for the features, you can apply, you can do things. So contrast this to the traditional programming. In traditional programming, we had data, like in this simple program, you can see that there's data and then there's program, which will give a result, right? So data plus program is equal to result in traditional programming. Contrast that with machine learning. In machine learning, we are going to provide data. Data is of course needed for everything, but the result also is provided along with the data in machine learning. So we provide the data and the result and then generate the program. So it's a paradigm shift, sorry. So it's a complete paradigm shift. Can you say that if there's no data, So that's also a very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's a leading question as well because it's a hot research topic. So there is uh, what is called as, uh, yeah, you're right. Machine learning requires huge amounts of data typically, but getting data is very difficult. I mean, some house prices and all that it is easy, but uh, for some advanced uh, application, for instance, self-driving car, driving the self-driving car is going on the street and then there is a completely new object which comes in front of it which is never observed self-driving car is cannot say oh i never observed this let me crash and go and crash into it right it's not that's not going to help so there's something called as a zero shot learning learning without any data so that's an active area of research one shot learning zero shot learning few shot learning Few short learning is learning with very limited data. One short learning is like learning with just one item, data item. So that's a lot of one shot. Exactly. That is what we are trying to simulate. So uh, uh, like a baby is able to recognize a cat, uh, a new cat that comes in just in a single shot, right? So we want to simulate that the human brain, that aspect of the human brain in mach using machine learning. So that's an active area of research. But yeah, typically data is needed um, and a whole lot of data. If it is deep learning, then you need a whole lot of data. Um, uh, so yeah, that is uh, one paradigm shift. And the most important paradigm shift is Deductive versus inductive. In traditional programming, the programs were deductive in nature. So we had if then else rules, iterations, loops, programming constructs, and using all those, we deduced conclusions. We came to conclusions, right? If, if somebody is like this, something is like that, then this is what we conclude. So that was traditional programming. In machine learning, it's inductive, it's not deductive. So we analyze the population, we model the characteristics, 
and we apply the model to new samples to induce behavior. Right? It's like how mathematical induction works, right? Uh, if it is true for one, if it is true for two, then if it is true for n and n plus one, it is true for every data, all the numbers, right? So induction, it's an inductive approach. So that is uh, what machine learning does. It's completely inductive. And in traditional programming, you measure the code in millions of lines of code, m logs, right? But in machine learning, it is very much in uh, line with uh, the low code, no code approach that is popular these days. The trend in software industry is for low code, no code. We don't want our employees to work hard and write code. And uh, so we want to make it easy for them. So low code, no code is a revolution that's going on in the software industry. And machine learning falls in line with that. I'll show you in the next slide how, how simple the code looks like in machine learning. In fact, you don't even need any code for doing machine learning. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you have a function, you can you know, write it, and then uh, let's say you feed lots of random uh, numbers uh, to the input parameters and take the output parameters. something uh, like that gets done. Uh, let's say there's a square root function, input is one parameter, output is one parameter. Can you generate a network that will uh, basically uh, produce uh, the square root in a meaningful way? Uh, That's a very good question again. Um, so the question is, uh, given a function like computing the square root there's a program which computes the square root so the question is whether that function can be implemented in machine learning, using machine learning techniques right so that's a very good question because artificial neural networks one of the machine learning programs called artificial neural networks is known as universal function approximator so that means you can approximate any function uh, any function's behavior using neural networks. So it could be square root, it could be uh, a complex function. In fact, uh, there is a paper which uses neural networks to compute uh, differential, to solve differential equations. So it's a universal function approximator. So um, any function can be approximated. So that is the power of deep learning. Right. Uh, deep learning uses artificial neural networks. Just one type of artificial neural, uh, one type of machine learning model called framework called artificial neural networks. Yes. Are there is this work being mostly done out of the school of engineering or uh, some of the people in that department also looking at this stuff? So they know all of the clinical performance. So that's also a very good question. So the question is whether this is uh, this study of machine learning is limited to um, just engineering schools or uh, it applies to both uh, other schools like uh, math and probably computer science and other areas. So that's a that's a very good question. Um, actually, we are a professor from uh, computer science department as well here. Um, he can speak to it, but. Yeah. What do you As a matter of fact, uh, our data science program for computer science involves math, involves uh, systems. So it's a joint program between the math department and the computer science department. That's a little bit of a sharing piece for all three aspects of computer science that are trying to teach them math and learning them. Well, I think the question uh, there is. Uh, Engineers, uh, we, we approximate things and we can <laughs> create uh, some machine learning uh, layer which can sort of get the square root of a number. Uh, when you look at it from uh, more theoretical uh, math background, do we understand the bounds of it that, uh, you know, 
this is exactly what we are doing. Whatever that is created here is actually is the cause of this model or this uh, the relationship, whatever that relationship is. Okay. And there's an actor there, the reason. So for instance, you can train a self-driving car to avoid past stops, for instance, and so on. But do you really know when you put it on the road and it sees something that it hasn't been trained on? Does it know to stop? And that's one of the foul, one of the limits that I think machine learning has. With expert systems, you can see in the rule base, you know, you didn't have a rule that said stop if you see this type of animal. But with machine learning, you really don't know what the train It's just like a child. You try to train the child, but yet, are you really sure it knows everything? No. Thank you. So, I, yes, another question? Is there, <clears throat> has the field advanced enough so that we can apply a formal or set of data and say, this we can write traditionally by code for? And this we need to be careful. Is there an understanding of where that divide is? Okay, the question is uh, if there is an understanding of the divide between traditional, where to apply traditional programming and where to apply machine learning. Uh, so, yeah, I think so. Uh, this slide particularly tells you uh, when we can use uh, traditional programming, right? So, when there is a deductive nature of the problem, the problem's nature is deductive. Uh, when we want deterministic uh, results with 100% uh, accuracy and things like that, uh, we use traditional programming. In machine learning, 100% accuracy is, is a myth. It never happens. So uh, machine learning is more uh, approximate reasoning. Well, well, thank you. Or conversely, we have to accept the inherent inaccuracy of the problem. Is there a, basically uh, an epistemological understanding of when the data is this fuzzy or this chaotic or this fractal? Uh, traditional programming can't solve the problem. Traditional programming doesn't solve the problem. Yes, but there's a whole bunch of engineering that is about each of kids, a bunch of techniques over a certain problem we know, which is all about we know the answer, the closed form answer of the problem. And there's another set of problems where so we don't know the closed form, but we have mathematical techniques that make it deterministic enough because it just specifies the mean and the variance. A lot of those things in computing are about real time or time bounded time, right? Yeah. Then there's the question of, okay, we're happy to sort of any good answer because this is a great way of analyzing a chaotic system or a fractal system or something else like that, right? Because, and what we want is we want insights into the problem so we know what to tweak because we're, we're basically in the position of fixing the airplane while we're flying. And there's a whole bunch of problems in which this seems to be the only answer. Yeah, that's right. So um, I think there are some answers in your question itself. Uh, okay. So like you talked about closed form, uh, um, the existence of a closed form solution. And the, so those are all some of the characteristics that belong to the traditional programming. Yes. And uh, the, uh, inductive nature of problems and inductive nature of uh, approximate nature of problems. So that's where machine learning can be applied. So, um, so for instance, okay, I'll give you another example, right? So the going back to the previous question, right? Uh, square root. 
you can you can write a square root uh, uh, to compute the square root using traditional programming yeah uh, and traditional programming is likely to produce better results for square root function than machine learning because machine learning is just approximation um, so it can be done square root can be computed using both traditional and machine, uh, machine learning right yeah. but we would obviously use traditional because first thing is it is simple to implement yeah. right we don't want to um, go the machine learning way and do a lot of things to just do a simple square root right so so i think uh, um, the intuition is there where to apply uh, traditional programming and where to apply machine learning and some of the points on this slide are kind of those guidelines. Okay. Yeah. So, like, if the problem, the nature of the problem is more deductive, then we go with traditional programming. If it is inductive uh, machine learning, um, if there's uh, if there's a lot of data that needs to be analyzed, we go with machine learning, um, and so on and so forth. So. Um, the big thing in uh, directive programming or traditional programming is uh, the tooling ecosystem. Of course, tools play an important role in machine learning as well. But uh, most of the software engineering tasks are related to static analysis, debugging, and using a whole ecosystem of tools. In machine learning, the predominant uh, activity is feature engineering, extracting the features from the data. So you are analyzing. You know, the problem is to predict the price of a house. So you are trying to analyze um, the data to get the features. What features in the data help us to predict the price of a house? That is called feature engineering. That's a very important thing, and it requires some domain knowledge. I mean, domain knowledge played an important role in artificial intelligence, even traditional artificial intelligence, like expert systems, was totally based on domain knowledge. So even today, domain knowledge plays a big role uh, in machine learning as well. And the other big thing in machine learning is hyperparameter tuning, right? So there are uh, what are called are hyperparameters, which need to be determined by the people, by the, by the programmers, not by the machines. The weights can be determined programmatically, but the eventual hyperparameters uh, need to be determined by the programmer. Uh, like the number of neurons in neural networks, the number of neurons is a hyperparameter. How many neurons would you want in your network is a hyperparameter. So those things have to be determined by the people. So hyperparameter tuning, I mean, there is some help from the machines, but eventually the decision is that uh, of the programmer. And the traditional programming was uh, code intensive, right? Uh, writing tons of lines of code, and in machine learning, it is more data intensive. You work with gigabytes of data, typically. And traditional programming, um, there is a the famous book in traditional programming by Donald Nuth. It's called The Art of Programming. It, it had some series of uh, volumes. Uh, it, it's like a Bible. I mean, uh, I look at that book as more like science of programming. I agree. I agree. I mean, he has written it like a science of programming, but uh, um, programming is really an art, right? I believe that programming is really an art because um, I had colleagues who had no formal training in uh, computer science or software, but were excellent programmers for many years. Uh, that is because programming has been an art for a long time. Whereas machine learning, on the other hand, is a data science. It's a science. It is based on solid theoretical and math foundations. I mean, computer science itself is applied math. In fact, most of the computer science departments are clubbed with, uh, with the math departments. But machine learning is more so, right? So those are some of the differences I could quickly come up with. Um, and then this is the most interesting part, right? The whole. Yes. Uh, it's really a science itself. Uh, when you 
use a uh, data science uh, and uh, uh, Markov programming, it kind of uh, diminishes the value of traditional uh, programming here. So I I would not accept that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I kind of agree with it, but it's a bit debate. So the, the comment is, I don't know if the microphones work well, but uh, the comment is that uh, it's a bit uh, derogatory or uh, diminishing to call programming as an art. It's really a science. I tend to agree. I mean, that debate is always there, right? For instance, management, you call it a science or an art. I believe that management is to a great extent art. I have an MBA in finance and I am telling you, management is still an art. With any number of uh, amount of study, you may not be able to perfect management. It's really a skill that needs to develop with time, right? The intuition, you can, nothing can cover the intuition that is required for management. So it's, it's debatable, but yeah, your comment is well taken. And this slide is the most interesting, right? So the whole semester long course is just in one slide, this one slide. You can see the amount of code that goes into uh, writing machine learning programs. So the first, the top part is the machine, le different machine learning algorithms, which are typically taught in a semester uh, a course, uh, semester long course, K nearest neighbors, support vector machines, um, Gaussian process and decision trees and all those things. Those are all different machine learning algorithms. And then you iterate over those algorithms using just two lines, because this, uh, this plotting is a, just for visualization kind of thing, but just two lines. One is to fit the model to the given training data set. And the other is to evaluate the accuracy with the test data set. That's it. Those, this one line generates the model, just one line. Oh, wow. So that is the power of machine learning algorithms, right? Compared to the, if you had to write the same code in traditional programming, it would take forever probably. Mm -hmm. So how does a typical machine learning task look? So first is the toughest challenge which is to collect the training data, right? So ground truth is like the frame of reference. Uh, collecting the ground truth or the training data is, a, uh, is really a challenge because it serves like the frame of reference, just like uh, the model apartment that uh, the apartment management shows to help us learn about uh, the remaining apartments, right? So just like that, we need some data which uh, is a frame of reference. So that is a very big challenge because, I mean, just getting the data is fine, but uh, the labels, the Y column that uh, we come up with is the challenge. So, uh, how, how is that different from uh, training test cases in traditional programming? If it, if it, if it has not been uh, tested for a case, so you don't know how it's going to behave. Then you have with the uh, machine learning, if you don't get the data, you don't know how it is going to behave with uh, unknown data. But yeah, so the question is uh, in traditional programming as well, if you don't know, uh, uh, there's a data which is totally new, uh, we are still in doubt. And in machine learning also same thing happens. So how is it different? Is that, does that summarize your question? Yeah, that is, so yeah, that's a, a good question. In my traditional programming, we know how exactly we came to that conclusion because there's a deduction process involved. But in machine learning, it's an inductive process and we don't know how exactly things happen. That is a very good question. All these are really excellent questions, uh, but they are all leading questions because this is an active area of research. Most of the questions that you're asking are active areas of research. And your uh, question relates to the explainability of machine learning algorithms, which is also an act active area of research. People are trying to build explainable AI. Because uh, suppose uh, 
you take a result from a machine learning program to the court for whatever reasons. Facial detection, right? Facial detection is a very important thing. Um, the court may not believe. I mean, how do you conclude that this person is this? There's no solid reasoning. So explainable AI is a very active area of research. So coming up with models which can explain themselves is an active area of research. Yeah, thanks for those questions. So coming back to our machine learning task. So the toughest challenge is annotating the data, coming up with the training data, labeling. For instance, my uh, PhD research was on veracity of uh, data, right? So uh, determining the truthfulness of data. Uh, say Twitter, there are so many tweets. How do you determine the truthfulness of data? Um, so for that, you need some training data, which is already labeled. You, have, you need at least 10,000, 20,000 tweets, which are already labeled as true or false. So you take medical domain, like the pandemic, there are so many rumors floating and all. How, so for those kind of medical domain kind of uh, important do problems, you really need experts to determine whether it is true or false. Each tweet is true or false, right? Because it could cause a panic reaction if a false tweet can cause a panic reaction. So you need really solid expertise in the area to determine whether it is true or false, which is very expensive. I mean, doctors we know are paid like, uh, for uh, engineers are probably the least paid. Um, uh, doctors are paid uh, maybe three or four times more than the engineers, right? They have a larger than life image in the society. So getting medical professionals to annotate is an expensive process, right? So that is the reason why it's, a, it's a, I call it the toughest challenge is to collect training data. That's the most difficult task in the entire machine learning stack. The next is to extract features. The next step is to extract, not the challenge, but the step is to extract features. So we need some domain knowledge. We need to understand what for instance, taking the, take the example of predicting the house price. We need to know some domain knowledge of a realtor, right? Like uh, we need to know how the carpet, the type of carpet impacts the price of uh, the house. So we need that kind of domain knowledge. So extracting features is the next step. Um, and then we need to learn the model. So model learning the model is essentially computing those different weights for the features, right? There are a bunch of features and we need to learn the weights for the features. Most of the machine learning models uh, depend on that, learning the relative importance of the uh, features. So that is where the alg machine learning algorithms come into picture, the learning part. And then the validation part. Uh, we obviously will not get 100% accuracy because everything is approximation is accuracy enough for us? So if it is uh, determining whether uh, Donald Trump, a lot of my students do this project on determining whether somebody's tweets are true or false, uh, political tweets. Uh, they are important, but not as important as say the medical tweets, right? Pandemic uh, can cause a whole lot of uh, havoc if they are false. So. For political tweets, maybe 70% accuracy is good enough or 80% accuracy is good enough. But for health related tweets, we want 98, 99%. So we apply the model. So what we do is uh, in the validation process, we divide the data into two. The training data set that we collected, we are going to divide it into two. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this one. So we are going to divide uh, the rows into two parts. Maybe the first 70, uh, randomly, 70% 70 of the data, 70% of the rows we'll use for training the model and the remaining 30% we'll use for validation or test as a test data. So what we basically do is we, for the validation data, we are going to close the result. So just like how students learn, right? Um, so, they don't look at the answers at the back of the text. The answers are already there, but they're not going to look at the answers first. They're going to take the, uh, solve the problems without looking at the answers first, and then compare the answers, how well they did. The same thing happens in machine learning. 
So this 30% of the rows, we are going to cover the results and ask the machine learning program to treat these 30% of the rows as test data and then determine the result. Then we compare the predicted result with the actual result, just like the students do, to determine the accuracy, how well the program did. So that is what happens in validation, the validation phase. So we determine, that's how we are going to determine the accuracy. We evaluate the accuracy. And then if the accuracy is not to the satisfaction, we tune the model. How do we tune? We have a bunch of hyperparameters, like in artificial networks, the number of neurons uh, or the number of layers of neurons. Those are all hyperparameters. We tune those parameters to make the model better. Or if the algorithm, like the point that was made previously, if the data is not linear and we are trying to apply a linear model, the accuracy will be some 50%, 60% or something like that. So in such case, we know linear models will not work well. So we are going to switch to non-linear models. So all that happens in the validation cycle. So this, this is a loop basically, you can see the arrow here, it's a loop. So we need to keep on refining the models. So insights into building the model. So, um, yes. Are you including data cleansing as part of data gathering? Yeah, that's a very good question also. Data cleansing is very important for machine learning. In fact, 70% uh, of the time, machine learning uh, uh, projects time is spent for pre-processing the data. And that includes cleaning the data, uh, normalizing the data and doing all sorts of things. So data pre-processing, cleansing, which includes cleansing is an important part of machine learning. I did not put it there because I didn't want to confuse uh, uh, the audience with too many details, but yeah, that is a very important uh, step. In the same, uh, uh, Exactly. So that is why it's a challenge. The question is, the comment is that labeling data, uh, if the label is incorrect, then the model is incorrect, right? Um, and uh, the model performance will also not be satisfactory. So yeah, labeling is a very important uh, uh, aspect and that is why it is very expensive as well. So, um, so how is the model built basically? The machine learning algorithm uh, tries to find patterns in the data. For instance, in the, all the data training data set that is there, say for instance, take the example of Twitter, right? Tweets, you have the number of likes, number of retweets, number of uh, favorite and, uh, and uh, all those features, right? So what are some of the patterns that uh, we could observe? The patterns could be that um, the number of retweets is not a very strong predictor of the truthfulness. For instance, um, there was a tsunami in South India uh, uh, and there were a lot of retweets of false information. So if your data set is that, then retweets will play a very low role. So that is one pattern. So it, uh, in other data set, probably the re number of retweets really indicates the number of uh, the truthfulness of the tweet. So it all depends on the uh, data set. So, but the idea is to search for those kind of patterns in the data collected as a training data set. So based on those patterns, we determine the weights for each features, right? And then the test data is classified based on the weights. The, Wait, the weights are basically the model, right? Uh, once you get the weights, you can throw away the data. You can even, uh, um, yeah, you just need the model to test, to apply to the uh, test data. And uh, the bigger the data, the higher the chances of precise results. So here's a very simple algorithm, the first uh, class, uh, 
I typically, the second class, first class is introduction, but the second class I typically teach this algorithm called logistic regression. So here you can see that uh, the features x1, x2, x3, these are all the features, the columns in the training data, right? These features are given to a summation box. And each feature has to be combined with a weight. So each feature has a different weight. We combine the features, values of the features with the weights. But so this, this assumes that there's a linear relationship. If you see the formula here, sigma wi xi. So this is the xi is a feature vector, right? This whole thing is a feature vector. Each this this corresponds to one row in the training data set. So feature vector, xi is a feature vector, and wi is the weight vector. So the weights for each of those features. You combine them together. I mean, weighted sum is not a, an unusual thing, right? In physics, chemistry, we have used weighted sums, weighted averages and weighted sums. So we do the same thing here. We combine the features with the weights and come up with a weighted average. There is a W0 term. So that is uh, the feature for that is one. So the W0 term indicates the inherent bias in the system. So what is bias? In real world, what is bias? Bias stems from assumptions, right? Simplistic assumptions. Like we assume that uh, uh, one gender performs, the, uh, like there's a age, uh, gender discrimination suit uh, that was settled a couple of days back with Google, I think, right? So there was a, there is a uh, simplistic assumption that one gender performs one way uh, and the other gender performs the other way. Similarly, age bias. So there's a simplistic assumption that certain ages cannot do certain things. So these are simplistic assumptions which result in bias. So same thing in machine learning. So there are simplistic assumptions which result in bias. So what is the simplistic assumption in this model that we are looking at? The simplistic assumption is that the features are linearly dependent. It's a very simplistic, typically features are not linearly dependent. So because of that, there's a bias inherent in the system itself. Even before you start, there's a bias. So that is that bias is characterized by the initial weight, W0. Now this weighted sum is quite intuitive. And then this bias also is quite intuitive. But the problem is, this is a, assume that there's a classification problem. We want to classify whether the tweet is true or false. So it's a classification problem. Um, so there are two classes, true or false. So the two classes have to be modeled by a probability, right? Just like the coin toss, heads or tails is modeled using probability. So the output of this, whatever machine learning program should be a probability. So to convert this big number of weighted sum of features into a probability, there is a function called logistic, logistic function. It's a sigmoid, one of the sigmoid functions. If you, from math, if you know, sigmoid functions have the shape of S. When you plot a sigmoid function, the shape is that of S. That's why they are called uh, sigmoid functions. And one such sigmoid function is a logistic function, which converts a real number into a number between zero and one. So this big number here is not between zero and one. We pass it through the sigmoid function called logistic function to get a number between zero and one, which is the probability of this particular data item with these features belonging to one class or the other, right? So this is the essence of the first machine learning algorithm called logistic regression. So logistic regression has very, a uh, logistic function has interesting properties. So let us start with the odds ratio, right? What is the odds ratio? You all know what an odds uh, ratio is, right? It's P by one minus P. The odds of raining today, uh, the ratio of the odds of raining today to the odds of not raining today, right? P by one minus P. Take the logarithm, log it, L-O-G-I-T, log it, logarithm, 
you get the logit function, logarithm of p by one minus p. And take the inverse of that function. What is the inverse of the function, logarithm function? It's the exponentiation. That is your logistic function. So it has a direct relation to probabilistic features. So logistic function is used as one of the simplistic uh, machine learning algorithms. Okay, I have a lot more slides, uh, but I think I will probably stop here. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, we have eight more, seven more minutes. So I'll probably quickly introduce to us a few more topics using some analogies because the abstract said that I will talk about some analogies. So the first analogy is how the children learn, right? Children learn in a supervised manner. So parents label everything, whether it is good or bad. Like I had a friend, classmate, whose dad used to label everything for him. So he invited uh, us to his home. Um, when we went there, his dad, his dad asked a lot of questions. And the final result was, uh, we didn't understand why he was asking those questions. He was basically labeling whether this, his son's friends are good or bad, whether they can continue uh, friendship with the, uh, with the friends. So that was the intention of calling us to the house. So parents have the habit of labeling everything for the children. This is good, this is bad, don't do this, don't do this, do this. So, so that is supervised way of learning. And the same thing happens in machine learning. So you have a bunch of data which is already labeled for you. You have the data, you have the labels, then you give them to the machine learning model or the algorithm which learns from the data. Then you come up with a prediction. So, so the prediction could be typically binary. Uh, if it is classification, typically the uh, classification is binary, true or false or square or triangle, but it could be multi-class also. There are different ways uh, of dealing with uh, multi-class problems, but typically it is binary classification and it could also be regression. Regression is when you predict a numerical value, which is a real number, like the price of a house. That's a regression problem. It's a numerical value. So in both cases, whether it is regression with numerical values or classification with a limited number of values, categories, you need labeled data. And then because the data is all labeled, it's called supervised learning, right? So that's the first analogy. So we have the data which is labeled. And then uh, if you have label training data, it is supervised. But generating these annotations or labels is a very expensive process, right? Um, so most of the data we have today is unlabeled, right? So most of the data is unlabeled, but we cannot just ignore the data just because it is unlabeled, right? We will, there's a lot of power in data, right? Information is power, right? Like that data is power. So when the data labels are missing, we still work with the data. And in that case, we call it unsupervised learning. There's no supervision, no labels. So unlabeled training data implies unsupervised learning. So what can we do with it? We try to determine the latent features in the data, hidden features of the data. And then we can do a bunch of things once we determine the latent features. So an example is students forming groups themselves. One of the first things that the students go without, do without so parent supervision is form friends, uh, make friends, right? Form groups of friends. So that is um, um, clustering. In one way, it's called clustering of people, right? So in uh, machine learning also, a similar process happens. And that process is called clustering. And that's based on latent features. See, we are not going to make friends with others based on the apparent features, like based on the hairstyle or uh, uh, height or weight. We are not going to make friends. We are going to determine the hidden features in the people.
to make friends, right? That's how the true grouping happens. Same thing in machine learning. We, the, the algorithms look for hidden latent features, not just those columns, the, not the columns in the table, but the hidden data inside the columns. And using those latent features, we combine the data together. So I'll illustrate one exam, one algorithm, one such a algorithm called k-means. So the idea is uh, I will choose uh, the data randomly, uh, or rather, um, so Gaussian mixture. It's a normal, normally distributed data, and normal. Uh, so there. Are three, you can clearly see that there are three groups of data items. So each of these point could be a person, it could be a house, whatever data you are trying to model. Each of those points represent those instances. Now the goal of the, I mean, we have, we have eyes so we can visualize, clearly see that there are three clusters, but machines do not have eyes. I mean, we, we need to come up with an algorithm which will be able to determine or separate three, these three clusters. Sorry. So how are we going to do that? So we are going to randomly choose a point here. So there's just one cluster. All the points are in just one cluster. And the center of this point is randomly here. We know that the center is not that, but we can randomly choose one, any point. So add another, cent another centroid. So this is the other cluster randomly chosen. This again is no, no way the center of the points, but it is random. Because there are three clusters, I will choose two, uh, third centroid also. I mean, it's not required, but so the third centroid is randomly chosen here. We know very well that it doesn't work, right? This is not the center. But through a number of iterations, oh, sorry. So Gaussian mixture, add centroid, add centroid, third centroid. Now we give the rest, the, the, um, the remaining stuff is done by the program. So, so through a number of iterations, the centroid is computed each time, right? Centroid we all know is like the center of the data points. So, what is the centroid of it? How do you compute the centroid of a triangle? You take the average of the coordinates, right? The same thing if you if it is if it is three points, average of the coordinates. If it is ten points, also average of the coordinates. We, we are going to do the same thing to compute the centroid each time. So we keep on doing this: update centroid, reassign points, update centroid, reassign points, and at one stage. The, the points do not move, the centroids do not move. So that results in clustering. So we basically clustered the points into three clusters. So that is an example of uh, unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, in uh, clustering, uh, we implicitly identified the latent features. We did not specifically identify, oh, this is a latent feature, that is a latent feature. But can we identify them explicitly? Can we determine the hidden features explicitly? So that can be done using what is called as, one of the ways of doing that is principal component analysis. So principal component analysis is like, a, is like coming up with a caricature of a person. We all know who the person is, although the, the picture that we are seeing there is does not belong to the person. We know the person who it is. Why? The reason is because the caricature is uh, it focuses on the oddities. For instance, the grin of uh, the, this person in the picture is uh, characteristic. It's it's unique across all the people, right? The teeth and then the cheek bones. Um, so that is where President Obama varies a lot from all other people, right? 
So capturing those oddities or those unique features, um, you're able to pretty much model the person, right? In a caricature. The same thing happens in principal component analysis. On the left-hand side, you see the data points spread, spread in two directions, but most of the variation is in this direction. So we can as well keep this direction and get rid of this di uh, direction, right? So this is the principal component or the hidden feature. The real features are these x-axis and y-axis. Remember each point, each item, data item is a point in space. So, and each feature is actually this axis, x-axis, y-axis, and so on. But in principal component analysis, we are going to come up with new axes, which are the hidden features, which cover the most variance. So that is the idea behind principal component analysis. And how do we determine this, uh, uh, the variance? By using what is called as eigenvectors, right? Eigen in German means characteristic, right? So we are going to get the juice out of the matrix of features. Right. So if you have noticed, all the points stretch. They are, they are uh, getting stretched as the points are moving. But the points on these red lines, uh, they, they don't change. So the, the points on the red line, they're not uh, um, changing the direction. Right, all other points they are getting stretched and also changing the direction, but the points on this red line are not changing the direction. The direction is still the red lines. So these points or the, these vectors are called eigenvectors. This is a simple linear algebra, high school math. So these eigenvectors help us determine the principal components. So. These are called eigenfaces. You can apply this eigen analysis, eigen vector analysis to faces, and you can actually determine the principal components of faces, images of faces. So you can see that the original image is the top left. And if you, uh, let me show the components first. So these are the components. These are the hidden features of the faces determined using eigenvectors. Right, so these are like basis vectors. So this is the first component, second component, third component, and so on of the faces. And then a, you can generate any face as a linear combination of these faces. So with 10 components, the first 10 components, the face looks like this, 20 components or whatever, 50 components, it looks like this and so on and so forth. With 100 components, you are pretty much able to re, uh, regenerate the face. Not exactly, but it is good enough for thing. So that is the power. This is just high school math. Eigenvalues, eigenvectors is just high school math. With, with just high school math, you are able to do all this interesting stuff. So there's a lot more. Um, so I'll probably, uh, if there's enough interest, I can talk more about these things in a different lecture, a different talk. But for now, because it's over time, let us end here. So any questions? If not, I will end the Zoom session now. Mm -hmm.